This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, photographer Matika Wilbur discusses her book, Project 562, Changing the Way We See Native America. She spoke about her efforts to shift how Native America is viewed through her photos. She's interviewed by American University professor Elizabeth Rule. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Rule. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and an assistant professor at American University. And I'm so excited to sit down today to talk to Matika Wilbur um, about her new publication, Project 562. She's an acclaimed photographer, a fierce advocate for Indian country, and also a newly published author. So welcome, Matika. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's nice to be here. Uh, My name is Matika Wilbur. I'm from the Swinomish and Tulalip tribes. And I am the creative, uh, the creator of Project 562, Changing the Way We See Native America, as well as, well as the co-host of the All My Relations podcast. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's just dive right into it. Um, it was such a pleasure to read your book. And I've been actually following your work for several years now. And so it's so exciting to have something out in the press uh, that people can get their hands on and have the opportunity to look at your incredible photography, as well as these interviews that accompany each of the photographs. And so really at the heart of this project is an intervention into the representation of indigenous peoples in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to take on this particular topic and to use photography specifically as a mechanism for investigating this material. Yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trained as a photographer. I studied photography in art school, but uh, after, after college, I was working in Los Angeles and the elders in my community, they said to me, you know, Matika, we'd really uh, like you to come home and work with the youth in our community. So I, I was raised in the Swinomish tribe in Washington state and my dad's tribe is Tulalip. And so some of the elders in my community said, can you come home and and teach photography, teach the young people what you've learned? And so I I came home and I started working with kids. And I was, you know, I was like 25 at the time. I I wasn't super enthusiastic about working with youth at the time. And, and, um, And they asked me to put together a curriculum that represented uh, our people, you know, because at the time, and and still to this day, you know, most textbooks that represent Native people uh, represent us in a post-19, don't represent us in a post-1900 context, you know, which is to say that uh, most people in this country uh, have a very stereotypical understanding of what is contemporary Indigenous identity. And, you know, that's been designed, you know, systemically designed um through policy and law for over many years, but also, you know, by Hollywood and the lurid, degrading representations of Native people over the last 150 years. And so, uh, you know, when it came time for me to put together that curriculum, I started looking for photography books that were published by Native people that I could show to my own young people. And, of course, what I found was an outdated narrative. What you find is uh, photos of a leathered and feathered Native people you know, images of um, Edward S. Curtis come to mind. And what we know is that those images deeply impact the psyche of Native youth. You know, Dr. Stephanie Freiberg's research has shown us that when Native children are exposed to the stereotypical image, their self-esteem declines uh, by like 60%. And what's shocking is when that image is shown to the white counterpart, their self-esteem is raised. And, you know, I certainly didn't escape uh, experiencing the effects of misrepresentations. You know, while I was teaching, we buried so many students. Um, Really, just like, we had so many funerals from unnatural death in my community with our young people, and it was so heartbreaking. And I remember I would like sit in lodges with the other teachers and we'd be begging the creator to ask, to help us asking, you know, like, what can we do differently? What have we done wrong? And it was during that time that 
I realized that if I didn't participate in changing the narrative and in creating a book, a curriculum, podcast, you know, like a full um, curriculum package that I could use to show to our young people that really uplifted the complexity of Indigenous intelligence that shined light on uh, some of our powerful and meaningful stories you know, resistance stories, abolition stories, but also just like stories from mothers and fathers and relatives and stories that um, our young people could read and relate to and not feel downtrodden by, you know, that was really the goal of my work was, you know, to create a body of work that I could share with my own people. And that really was the impetus of this project. So wow. that's where I started. Yeah. Wow, that's really incredible. And um, again, you know, I just felt so fortunate to have the opportunity to finally sit down with this piece. And I would encourage all of our listeners today to absolutely check out this book. It, in addition to having just these amazing photographs, right, also is doing that work, right, of advocating for Native communities and really offering this intervention into how we're seen, right, as Native peoples in the public. And so one of the things that I noticed, um, you know, in the book is that there's, of course, tremendous diversity represented. Um, And that's true because we are a diverse peoples, right? Um, We are distinct um, in accordance with our tribal nations in the areas of cultural practices, language, spirituality, even our histories are distinct, of course, and our politics and governance. Um, But in the midst of that diversity and all the beauty that's within that, there are also several themes that I saw emerging um, that connect tribal nations across the country. And those were around things like food ways, food sovereignty, the revitalization of cultural practices and language, and even the idea of tribal sovereignty. So can you talk about some of those shared experiences that really unite Indian country, as well as some of the elements where you saw the beauty of diversity across our Native communities? Uh, Yeah, well, you're right, uh, Professor, there. um, Our people are not a monolith. We, um, our experiences, our backgrounds, our belief systems are as varied as, you know, like the forest is. It's their... um, And, you know, I didn't realize how much I didn't know about Indian country until I did this project, right? Like uh, visiting different communities would really open my eyes to all sorts of incredible experiences. Um, You know, in, in my travels, I would get to go to all kinds of different places. You know, I get to go, um, to ceremony and I would get to go to places and see like bear dances, which I'd never seen before or hoop dances or brush dances or crown dances or a launchka. You know, I'd meet bird singers. Um, I'd meet folks that um, participate in Native American church or folks that, you know, are Christians or Baptists or, you know, I, my experiences were so varied and, you know, that what we're talking about with my project 562 is uh, a journey that I went on for about a decade. So uh, back to you know the origin story in 2012, when I started this project, I sold everything. I packed my bags and uh, I hit the open road. And uh, since then, I have lived in, you know, I lived in a, a two-seater Honda. I eventually moved into the big girl. <laughs> That's my war pony. She got her name because she likes to back it up. <laughs> And then I moved into like the bougie big girl, which was a big RV. And I traveled um, for un- until the pandemic, until 2020. So for eight years. And I started in Washington and Oregon, California. I moved my way uh, till eventually I would go to every state. I went to Alaska, you know, like a dozen times. I went to like over 450 tribes in the United States. The project is called Project 562, which stands for the number of federally recognized tribes. When I started the project, there's now 574. And, um, you know, I 
I would certainly say, yeah, there were many things that uh, I learned along the way. There's incredible diversity in Indian country. I, and, you know, what co- connects us, in, um, it, you know, it's, that's a really an interesting que- question, Elizabeth, what connects us in Indian country. I think uh, the reason that we started our podcast, All My Relations, is so that we could discuss indigenous relationality. In my travels, I would find that everywhere that I went, uh, people had a really interesting and beautiful way of describing their indigenous identity. Um, You know, when I started this project, I was really interested in narrative correction work, but also uncovering what it means to be uh, an Indian. You can't see me, but I'm holding up air quotes. You know, and I would ask people that question, what does it mean to be a Native person in this century? And when I met John Trudell, um, he said to me, you know, I really like what you're doing here, but I wonder if you're asking the wrong question. Uh, He said, you know, the only thing an Indian has ever known is relocation, termination, and assimilation. Maybe you should start asking people what it means to become human in their own language. And then what I found is that when I switched to asking that question, people would start telling me about the deeper parts of their identity. And oftentimes they would introduce themselves to me in their language. And um, they would introduce themselves as uh, their traditional understanding of themselves, their traditional place-based understanding. And what I found everywhere that I went is people identified themselves by their relationship to their place. And and that has a deep and knowing uh, way of describing itself, you know, as the people of the blue green water or the people of the tall pine trees or the people that live within the four sacred mountains. And uh, those those land based identities, I think, would be the common thread that I found is that, you know, our people are stewards of the land. Um, our people are stewards of these places. And, and oftentimes we've been relocated. Right. Um, as a as a. Uh, as a result of like public policy, <laughs> we've been relocated and put onto reservations. But uh, that doesn't mean that our relationship doesn't predate these these colonial understandings um, and this colonial experience. And so I, I found that when people started talking to me about their land based identities, I started to put together this common thread, which was that um, you know relationality and kinship is integral to indigenous identity that um, and that there is no separation from that relationality, you know, and that the work of colonization is individualism, right? And the antithesis of individualism is relationality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really beautiful. And thank you for sharing us, uh, sharing with us a little bit of insight into how this project has even changed over time and your own thinking has transformed, right? Um, As you've gotten deeper and deeper into it. That's incredible. I want to build on one of the topics that you brought up, which is federal recognition. And I want to spend some time talking about that for our viewers and listeners who may be unfamiliar with this concept. So as you mentioned, the title of the book is Project 562, with 562 representing the number of federally recognized tribes that existed within the United States at the time of writing. Today, as you mentioned as well, that number has risen to 574. Um, But federal recognition is a very nuanced and complicated subject. And of course, we also know that there are indigenous peoples like the Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiians who are represented in your text, but who do fall outside of that federal recognition framework. So can you tell us just a little bit about what federal recognition is for those who may be unfamiliar and how you have navigated that really important and interesting topic? Yeah, well, I'm going to show you guys something. I um, So on the cover of my book, um, it says Project 562, and you'll see in the center of my logo, there's a there's this, um, like a dot, and then there's a crescent and a trigon. And I put those there when I first designed the project. Um, you know, in Coast Salish art practice, uh, it's it's all based off of uh, learning how to make art like water, learning how to be like water. 
And so you'll see in the center, there's always like a drop of water and then there's a crescent that goes out and a trigon that moves from it. And it's um, like representative of like the, the fact that we're interconnected, but that things always keep moving, you know, like how water just keeps going on this continuous cycle and journey. And so I, I added that to uh, the project title when I started because I knew that um, that this project would be something like that, like it would just keep moving and, and go on for a long time and that I... I knew that I would be, um, that the title would change, right? Um, There has been concerted efforts by the federal government to eradicate tribal identity, to eradicate tribes, you know, certainly during Indian termination, but but certainly on contact. Um, And, you know, this uh, federal stature, uh, this federal stature of being a federally recognized tribe, um, is it's yeah it's sticky it's certainly sticky (laughs) that would be an easy uh, like a a nice way of putting it um you know there's like and i'm certainly not a person that can speak to the complexity of what it means to fight for federal recognition one might want to talk to like a wampanoag about that my friend paula could tell you exactly what's required to become a federally recognized tribe uh but I do know that for me, when I started the project, I needed to have a place to go to. (laughs) So, you know, I looked up the number of tribes in the United States and tribes with an address that I could find. And that's how I named the project. And when I look back on it, I think it might be short-sighted. It might have been a little short-sighted, you know, like I could have gone with any title. I could have just been with like Indigenous or something or Native America or a title that would have been more encompassing. But I also wanted to uh, pick a title that would talk about the individualism of each nation, right? And that each nation is its own uh, nation with its own efforts for sovereignty and self-determination and and is working on its own projects, you know. And I certainly wouldn't want to create a project titled something like Native America because because then we we like kind of swim into the murky waters of of um, of describing our people in, in that monolithic way, and so you know to become a federally recognized tribe means that you have a land base. It means that you have a language. It means that you have you can trace your ancestors, and there's other uh, you know there's other ways that they qualify that and. And that number is always changing based off of the plenary power of Congress. And, you know, what I would find when I was traveling is that I would also visit with a lot of people in urban Indian centers. I would visit visit with folks, um, you know, in, like you said, in in, uh, Kanakamali territory. I would also go to visit Aotearoa and even into like Puerto Rico and Mexico and Canada, um, you know, the breadth of this work expands beyond what federal recognition. I certainly met with plenty of folks who were from state recognized tribes. I pretty much met and photographed anybody that was willing to talk to me. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, in the archives, there's about 1200 people that I photographed. And uh, unfortunately, not all of them are in the book. You know, there's um, I'm limited by the number of pages <laughs> and really like the weight and like what is like the, the uh, you know, like realistic for somebody to carry around in a book. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, the journey certainly took me to meet with more folks than just those that are federally recognized, but certainly a lot of places that were. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned that you went out and took photographs of so many folks many of whom ultimately don't even appear in this book. And that was one of the things that I was struck by as a reader, was the way that you incorporated such a range of perspectives, right? You talk to both children and youth, as well as elders. You talk to people who are working in the space of culture, but also in the space of politics. Um, You talk to folks who are very land-based and living within their reservation or traditional territories, but you also, of course, bring in that urban indigenous component. 
And so can you tell us a little bit about the process? How did you determine who you were going to speak to and who ultimately was selected for inclusion in the book? Oh, you know, that's so buried. You know, I I traveled for years and years and years. I photographed people in so many different types of settings, you know. Um, sometimes I would meet folks at a conference and photograph them afterwards. Sometimes I would uh, not know anybody. And, I, you know, like I think of when I first set off on this journey, I um, I was heading towards Northern California and um, I was like, okay, where am I going to go? <laughs> you know, like, I just was, I really, you know, took a very organic approach to this. You know, like the project started in ceremony. Um, the project was guided by my relatives and my, my community. You know, and oftentimes I'd put something up on Facebook and say like, hey, I'm going here. Does anybody know anybody? And people would connect me. And then I would stay until I'd met enough people that I felt like, I'd gotten, um, you know, like I'd done a good job of telling a story or meeting with folks from that community. So, you know, I wasn't on like a strident, a Western production schedule. You know, a lot of producers <laughs> would um, would really like frown at the way that my methodology, you know, for a lot of reasons, not just because I wasn't on a production schedule, but because I believe in sharing agency with my subject. You know, I um, I, I was trained in in western forms of journalism but i really actually feel like western forms of journalism are rooted in white supremacy and you know we are taught that if we um if we take the photo if we click the shutter then according to copyright law the image belongs to me Uh, but if i actually believe in the teachings of my ancestors and i follow these traditional potlatch ways you know like just like we have with our songs i might have been given the right to sing the song but it doesn't mean it belongs to me and i feel like the same is true with the image and with the story of the person like people have been kind enough to let me take their photograph but i don't feel like it belongs to me i believe that i share that photo with the person and so you know in each place that i went to each person that i photographed um i would ask them where they want to be photographed. I would ask them, you know, like what kind of questions do they want to talk about in their interview? Um, I would not presume to know that I, (laughs) that I had the most interesting questions, you know, like I really wanted um, people to contribute in a way that um, felt meaningful for them. And so I would ask them like, what are some of the issues happening in your community right now? Is there anything you want me to be sure to cover? And people had answers, you know, people have stories they want told. And I felt like using those principles was um, super important for the way that this project unfolded. But, you know, the way that I found folks uh, was so varied. Uh, But like I was saying earlier, when I went to Northern California and I met uh, for the first time, I went to the Talawa Diné Nation. And I told them, I walked into the cultural center and I said, hey, I'm here to take some photos. I'm trying to make some friends. And they were like, wait, hold up. Who are you and what are you doing? And, (laughs) you know, they said, well, why don't you come meet with the cultural department and explain what you want to do? And I was so nervous. You know, I hadn't ever uh, really given a presentation about the work or explained what I wanted to do. And, and, you know, I I showed them photos of my portfolio and, and explained while I was doing it. I talked about you know, my experience in education and why I believe that our children deserved better images. And and they agreed, you know, and they agreed. They, so they said, we'll, we'll support you. And um, they introduced me to, you know, like the their language keepers, their culture keepers, their elders, their youth. Uh, they fed me, they housed me, you know, uh, because this project was uh a Kickstarter funded, the average donation was $20, you know, from like thousands of folks. I, and over the course of two Kickstarters, I raised about $300,000 on Kickstarter. And then, you know, uh, foundation money also supported the work. But, you know, um, the work actually lived because people like that, like Marva, who's actually in the book and and others, like, let me take their photograph and then introduce me to the next tribe that I was going to that was 10 miles down the road, you know? And so then they took me down the way and, and introduced me to the next group of people and, and supported the work and on it went around the country like that. And then as time grew, so man, my social media grew, 
um, and, and awareness about my project grew, then it became a little bit easier. Um, but I actually remember one time, you know, like when I didn't have, um, when I didn't know anybody and I didn't have any, and I called. So I just like drove my RV up and put a sign outside. Like I went to, you know, the, I went to like the local Rite Aid or whatever. And I bought, you know, like one of those big signs and I got a marker and I put on there like free fiber. <laughs> and I put that on the outside of my RV <laughs> and then, and then, uh, you know, uh, people came and I met folks and, <laughs> and then I got to photograph people there. So, you know, the methods varied. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so amazing. And again, thank you for giving us a little bit of insight into what this has looked like for you. I mean, one of the things that you said that really resonated with me is the fact that this project evolved in a very natural way over time. It's not necessarily that you set out to do one particular thing and then stayed within the confines of that. It sounds more like you were driven by a vision and a purpose and then let the people that you interacted with guide how that took shape, what that looked like and responded to the individual needs of the community. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate your comments about relationship building and reciprocity there. Um, And I think that that's so inspirational, especially to our next generation of Native researchers, people who want to work with Native communities, um, people that want to embark on artistic projects. So, you know, thank you for sharing that knowledge with us today. Um, Another question that I have for you, Matika, is can you tell us about the process of transforming this, you know, decade-long project where you're out, you know, throughout the U.S., in a van, you know, making these homemade signs to eventually publishing this book. Um, I understand that you've also done things like curated exhibits and held artist residencies in the interim. So can you tell us a little bit about the various iterations of this work over time? Yeah, well, you know, when I first started the project, I wrote a blog and I published weekly. So um, I, I, published like weekly um, on the road stories. Uh, and every two weeks I would put out a film on YouTube. <laughs> and it's not something I don't YouTube anymore. Uh, now we make reels, which is a whole different thing. Uh, but you know, like uh, I have a podcast, like I said, called All My Relations, which we started uh, to talk about indigenous relationality. Uh, I, yeah, I've done artist residencies. I've held exhibitions. You know, I had exhibitions, solo exhibitions all over the country. I have one up right now in Santa Monica. It comes down in May. Um, I'm working on three new exhibits that open up next fall. I've developed curriculum to accompany the the book, which I'm really excited about. Um, I've written articles, you know, for and op-eds uh, for various syndications. I've done a lot of public speaking, (laughs) way more public speaking than I'd like. But um, also, it feels like an honor and a privilege to be invited into communities. You know, I think I've done about uh, 500 keynotes in the last five or six years. Um, Certainly, most of those happened during October and November, right? During Native American Heritage Month. We're all um, not anymore, not since I had a baby. But before having a baby, I would probably do like 20 to 30 keynotes just in November alone. <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, I, I've um, I've also made films. I just premiered my first um, short documentary. And, um, yeah, so I've done all, all, all different kinds of forms of storytelling. Wow, really incredible. So, you know, for all of our listeners out there, make sure, of course, you get this book. But also check out the other amazing work that Matika Wilbur is doing across so many different mediums. Um, that's that's really incredible to hear. Now, you brought up your um, your daughter, right, your child. And I noticed in the book um, you dedicate it to her and you talk in that segment briefly about indigenous futurity. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about what you mean um, when you're talking about indigenous futures and what you think that is going to look like? (laughs) No, just a small question. What she's (laughs) talking about is this, um, this on this first part of the page, that's that's my baby Alma B. I'm showing them the picture, Elizabeth. And it says um, for Alma B, 
Uh, may your children hear and breathe the words of our Indigenous ancestors. May we all be so lucky to know an Indigenous future. And, uh, you know, I, I imagine that you picked up on that because of your studies and who you are. And, and that's why I wrote it that way for those that would get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Um, you know, I often have this dream. Um, I have this recurring dream where I'm sitting on a train or a plane or a boat and I'm always traveling in my dreams and I look over and I see these people and um, they're postits, they're non-natives and they're they're speaking is what they're saying to each other as they're walking by each other getting on the train you know good afternoon relative I see you how are you? Good day, you know, and I realize I'm dreaming about a modern world that didn't aim to erase its indigenous intelligence, but rather a modern world that upheld the complexity of our belief systems. Um, a modern world that didn't believe that our languages and our cultures and our belief systems should be annihilated and that we should be a assimilated into a dominant Western culture, but rather in a modern world that believed that that our ways of knowing are worth valuing and teaching and uh, perpetuating in our daily lives. And we often talk about on our podcast, imagining and otherwise, you know, so part of believing in liberation or believing um, in sovereignty and self-determination and, and indigenous nationhood is believing that it's possible, right? When our ancestors signed those treaties, they, they wanted the right to maintain access to their traditional places and the right to maintain their life ways, you know. And, and so we often forget in this nation that treaties are the original law of the land. They predate the Constitution and they're meant to be upheld that way. And I believe that it was incredibly profound, you know, when I look back on my ancestors who signed the treaty, that they knew that in order for us to be uh, to continue being who we are, we would need access to these places. You know, that as much as we talk about an indigenous future, we also have to talk about, you know, like the seventh generation concept, the concept of knowing where we come from um, in order to know where we're going, you know, that we're always uh, inextricably connected to the generations that come before us. We situate ourselves in this lifetime, but we live for those that are coming next. And I think that some of those profound and moving value systems deserve to be a part of the collective consciousness in what is now known as the United States. Uh, because right now, this nation is struggling with its identity, this little baby nation that's only 250 years old, you know, it's struggling and um, it needs those deep teachings that come from the people that know this place, you know, that could deeply, I think, shift um, the collective consciousness in a way that is better for all of us. So, you know, what do I imagine when I imagine an indigenous future? I imagine us speaking our languages. I imagine... Uh, my baby having the opportunity to go to an indigenous education school that isn't rooted in white supremacy. I imagine a place where we're not burning books <laughs> because of critical race theory that there aren't people that are like anti-trans or anti-native or anti-black, you know, a world where um, rematriation is is no longer a term that we need to talk about because we already live in a matriarchal society, you know, like where the patriarchy isn't oppressing us on a daily basis, where capitalism isn't, uh, you know, like part of what we're fighting against every day for the time to be with our families. You know, I, I can imagine an otherwise, and, and I can imagine an otherwise because it's very close. Um, we're very close to that otherwise, right? Like my ancestors can tell me, my relatives can tell me about a time when there was an otherwise. So I have to believe that it's possible. <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you again for your reflections on this subject. I mean, all of these themes really come through in the book. And um, that's one of the things that makes it so amazing is 
to be able to look and see really a community um, that I think you established right through this project, um, you know, that that considers these topics together and thinks through them and learns from one another. So um, it, it's really a pleasure to hear your reflections on these ideas. And one of the main organizing features of the book, of course, is that it is organized by profile, right? Um, you go out to communities, you meet with individuals, and in the book, readers will see both the portraits of those individuals as well as usually an interview or some type of written segment where those people and their voices are present. Um, and so for readers uh, or people who are considering getting the book, uh, which you absolutely should, uh, Matika, could you please share with us a couple of really outstanding profiles um, that would give a larger sense of the text as a whole? Oh, man, what a question. Um, In this book, it's uh, like almost 420 pages. And, um, you know, there's some, there's some, larger essays on some of the experiences that were more moving for me. Um, One of them is an essay about MMIW, about protecting Native women, about, um, it's called Protect Indigenous Women. And uh, that piece was really important to me to keep in there. Uh, during um, During the first year of my project, it was in, uh, actually it was the second year, I guess, in 2014, there was a major effort to reform the Violence Against Women's Act. And I was called upon to take photos and testimony from Native women who had been victimized uh, by non-Native perpetrators on reservation lands. And uh, I must have interviewed and photographed around 150 women who had been impacted by, you know, federal law and federal policy that um, made it impossible for us to prosecute non-Natives on Native land. And it's part of the reason why, you know, uh, one in three Native women are experience um, rape in their lifetime. We know that three out of four Native women experience sexual assault or domestic violence in their lifetime. And, um, And I certainly, you know, like, I certainly didn't escape that reality. You know, I grew up on the res. I have four sisters. I have a daughter. You know, I often um, think about that and worry about that. You know, it's a public health crisis, like a public health emergency that has gone unanswered for far too long. And so, you know, writing about that in my book was critically important to me, I think, There isn't a more important call to action that we could have when discussing Native America than a a call to action to protect Native women. And um, and so that's a really important uh, piece for me. Uh, There's more I could go on and on, but I don't know how many of them, how many you want me to talk about. (laughs) Sure, sure. Well, let me maybe ask you this. Um, I think you are probably one of a very small handful of people who've had the opportunity to go out and visit with all of the indigenous communities or, or most of the indigenous communities across the United States. Um, that's, that's a rare privilege, right, that, that you've had. And in addition to something like the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls crisis that you raise, what are some of the other primary issues that you see affecting indigenous communities across the nation? Um, oh my gosh. You know, uh, I think right now we, uh, all of us should be talking about what's happening with the Indian Child Welfare Act. You know, um, let me say that again, what, what's happening with the Indian Child Welfare Act. And y'all have to excuse me, I'm just getting over laryngitis. So. <laughs> I know I sound terrible, but this is just where we're at today. (laughs) But um, the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA, is uh, an effort to keep Native children in Native homes because for generations there was policy to remove Native children 
from Native Homes. Uh, my good friend, Brooke Sweeney, made an incredible film about it called Daughter of a Lost Bird, if any of you are interested. Uh, we also made an episode on, you know, on the podcast uh, about this called Native Children Belong in Native Homes. But uh, it's being heard right now in the Supreme Court in Brackeen versus Holland. And depending on the court's decision, ICWA might be overturned. And ICWA is what protects Native children and makes sure that they stay in Native homes. And, and, and actually, like, the legal ramifications um, and the repercussions could upend the legal basis for tribal sovereignty. So it's an incredibly important case that everybody should be following and, and sign the petitions and follow along in. Um, I also, you know, I also wrote about in um, in the book, I wrote, wrote about the movement to protect Mauna Oakea in Hawaii. You know, there's an ongoing active resistance camp in Hawaii. And, you know, I had the uh, I had the pleasure of, of visiting and photographing many of my Kanaka Maoli relatives and in, in the illegally occupied kingdom of Hawaii. And um, I got to meet with Auntie Pua and Auntie Nui Nui and, and Lana Kila and, and an uh, incredible group of uh, activists, scholars, resistors, uh, including Jamaica Osorio, who's incredible. And, you know, folks who are doing uh, the work to protect their sacred places. The, there's an effort right now uh, to build a 30 meter telescope on top of uh, their Mona, you know, which would go like miles deep into the earth and stories high and be, would be one of the largest telescopes on earth on top of what is one of the most sacred sites in all of Oceania. And there's already 13 existing telescopes, several of which have already been, um, that they've already been like, they're no longer being used. Like, and so <laughs> there's this, there's this movement, of course, and has been a resistance camp to stop the 30 meters telescope on top of uh, Mauna Oakea. And I think, you know, it begs the question, uh, you know, uh, why is why is this happening? You know, like, why is Hawaii an illegally annexed kingdom? How has narrative participated in shaping um, our perception of Hawaii as this paradise vacation land for the taking you know why is electricity uh being <laughs> rationed out to residents and people that go there are using air conditioning at will you know like why do people even think that they should be going to hawaii in the first place you know in a place that has limited resources in and go there without investing into community you know is, is some of the questions but certainly why do people feel like they need to summit the mauna you know most native hawaiians believe that the Mauna is a sacred place reserved for the high gods. But uh, tourists go there every day, you know, in blatant disrespect of, of Kanaka Maoli cultural beliefs. And so I think there's this reckoning that has to happen, you know, and, and that also exists in most public lands. You know, I, um, I'm really proud of the work that Deb Holland has been doing, um, you know, both with the movement to change um, some of the racial, the you know, these very racist language that's used in national parks, you know, like there's, uh, she had made an initiative to remove the, uh, the name Squaw, which is a, a racial slur uh, from over 200 national parks in the United States. In a few weeks, actually, Deb Holland is coming um, to Tulalip, to my tribe, um, where she'll be, Secretary Holland will be visiting to uh, present her work and to do interviews um, on the road to healing for truth and reconciliation for boarding schools in the United States. You know, um, it was actually in um, 2021 that uh, Secretary Dob Holland announced the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative which directed uh, the Department of the Interior by Secretary Memorandum to undertake an investigation of the loss of human life and the lasting consequences of the federal Indian boarding school system. And the truth about the U.S. Indian boarding school policy has been largely written out of the history books. You know, there are more than 350 government-funded and often church-run Indian boarding schools across the U.S., 
Um, and, you know, our Native children were forcibly abducted by the government. They were sent to schools hundreds of miles away, and they were they ex- experienced extreme trauma in those places. And, in fact, um, on the cover of my book, Dr. Henrietta Mann uh, talks about the experience of going to an Indian boarding school and not ever hearing somebody tell her that she loves that they love her, you know, and how that had a lasting impact on her and how she was able to overcome that. And, and you know, I, that's part of the reason why I chose Dr. Nancy Henry is because I think it's an incredible um, feat, you know, to grow up in a loveless in a loveless way and to overcome that and be become a loving person and open schools for native people. I mean, I just, I think it's profound and there's so many stories like that in the book of people talking about their experiences in boarding schools and, and, you know, there, that right there has never been a reckoning in this nation, right? Like, There has not been a massive effort for truth and reconciliation. Certainly places have done it, right? Canada has been working on it. Uh, It certainly happened in South Africa. But the United States has yet to look into the effects of genocide, assimilation, termination on some of the policies that were enacted upon Indigenous people in this country and apologize and start taking actual action for restitution And that to me is just crazy (laughs) that, you know, like in the wake of George Floyd and in this uh, culture of wokeness that we live in, that there has not yet to be a reconciliation with our past. And so I'll just say that much. (laughs) I said enough. (laughs) And, you know, I just want to really underscore um, the things that you said, right? Um, Gender-based violence conservation, environmentalism, and sacred sites, and also connecting the Indian Child Welfare Act that you mentioned, which is in the Supreme Court right now, um, with boarding school history, right? Many people don't realize that ICWA was inspired by the history of boarding schools and the systematic separation of young Native people and children from their families, communities, cultures, and nations. Um, And so I just want to really underscore and highlight again all of those issues that are shared issues across and between our very diverse tribal nations. Um, Matika, to bring it full circle, um, if we are to go back to the very first question and the very origins of this book, which was to make an intervention into the representation of Native peoples and showcase Um, what Native peoples look like, the struggles that we have, the histories that we have survived through, um, and all of the beauty and diversity and brilliance that exists within our tribal nations today. Um, What is one major takeaway you hope that readers gain from this new text? I mean, um, my hope with this book was, and, and the way that I chose to write it, was letting um, try, I tried really hard not to over editorialize people's work. Um, You know, I I left in, you know, like uh, the syntax of the way that individuals speak. I I tried not to insert myself uh, where I wasn't needed. (laughs) I tried to let people speak for themselves um, because because our people deserve that, right? And, you know, Native America is vast and sprawling and beautiful, and there isn't anywhere that you can go in what is now known as the United States that isn't Native land, right? Like every sing- every cul-de-sac, every river, every estuary, every city, every suburb, you know, has um, an Indigenous history. And those Indigenous histories and those Indigenous people are worth knowing. And so I hope that uh, in reading this book, you get to know people a little bit more intimately and personally, you know, that it can humanize Native America for a way, in a way um, that hasn't been done for you in the past. And and that by reading this book, you can overcome, um, you know, some of the statistics that we know to be true, which is that 72% of them 
Americans say that they've never encountered a Native person. We can overcome some of, you know, certainly with this book, we can overcome that that truth that we talked about in the beginning, which is that 82% of textbooks in the United States do not cover Native American history and peoples in a post-1900 context, which lends itself to this idea of extinction, that Native people are extinct and nothing could be further from the truth. And so what I hope that happens when you read this book is you get to know that Native America is alive and well and vibrant. And there are very real issues um, that are still being shaped by public policy and public opinion and Supreme Court decisions like the Indian Child Welfare Act that need public support. And so I hope that by getting to read this book, you get to know us a little better and thereby can become a relative and can to um, the Native people whose land you live upon. Matika Wilbur, I want to say thank you. Chokmashki, thank you in the Chickasaw language mm-hmm. for your time today, for your work on this project spanning over a decade, and of course, congratulate you on the publication of Project 562. To all of our listeners, I encourage you to go check out this book. It's available now. And of course, to keep up with Matika Wilbur and all of her work, including her podcast, All My Relations. Thank you, Matika. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. <laughs>